Welcome to Afterwards. My name is David Brooks, and we are here to talk about a book called The Neoconservative Persuasion, essays, selected essays from 1942 to 2009. And the book was written by, or con this consists of writings written by Irving Kristol. Uh, Irving Kristol is not here because he died last year in September, but we are joined by his son, Bill Kristol, who will probably need no introduction to anybody watching this. Uh, Bill Kristol uh, grew up in New York. Let's see if I know your resume. He used to be my boss, went to Harvard <laughs> University, taught at Penn, worked for uh, William Bennett at the Education Department, Dan Quayle, and now edits a fine magazine where I used to work called The Weekly Standard. Uh, Very well done. <laughs> thank you, thank you. And so I thought we'd start by talking about your dad's life uh, because I think neoconservatism and a lot of American conservatism flows out of his life. And the first thing I want to ask you about was his upbringing, the class, social class he was raised in, what, is, what your, I guess, uh, grandfather did. Right. Uh, and uh, because I think his, those roots informed a lot of his writing later on. Uh, he grew up poor, but I think he says somewhere maybe in this book that he didn't realize he was poor, you know, he, that everyone was poor in his neighborhood in Brooklyn. Uh, poor working class. His father, my grandfather, was employed as a jobber and a tailor. Um, and I think fairly regularly employed, though I, I think in the Depression, like everyone else, he right. lost his job and may have had to start over once or twice. Um, but I think my father had a, his father, his mother died when he was young, when he was a teenager, but apart from that, I think he had a, a happy childhood and I think very much of a, uh, a sense that um, there was none of the later, none of the class resentments that Marxists wanted to think that the working class should have in the 20s and 30s and none of the alienation that later sociologists thought that, you know, being a Jewish kid in a Christian America uh, would, would cause. I think he had a happy and well-adjusted childhood and then went to City College of New York. Yeah, and I think, well, we'll get to this later on, but he would talk about, people would say, well, poor people think this, poor people think that. And he'd say, wait, we were poor. I wouldn't, we didn't think any of this stuff. Right. Uh, but right. so then he went to City College, uh, a legendary place, legendary, and I talk to college students these days about City College and the way I say, I don't know if this is true, but I hope it is, that the faculty was sort of impressive. There was a famous philosopher, Morris Raphael Cohn, I think it was there. But the lunchtime conversations were more impressive and famously young students sat at two alcoves, alcove one and alcove two, and I think one was Trotskyite, one was Leninist. Yeah. I assume your father was in the Trotskyite. I think alcove. they may have been more than two alcoves. Well, there were just alcoves were just, you know, the little parts of the dining room, I guess, and then they got, maybe they were technically called alcove one and alcove two, but he just got associated, the, the people would bring their lunches, I think, or buy very cheap lunches from the cafeteria and would sit with their fellow ideological group. But I think there were maybe more than two social democrats and Mensheviks, and there were many varieties of Marxists, quasi-Marxists, anti-Stalinist Marxists, pro-Stalinist Marxists. My father was a Trotskyite. Uh, much has been made of this afterwards. I don't know that it was quite as big a deal. I mean, he, was, he had fond memories of it, and he thought he learned a lot having to argue with Stalinists and argue with other socialists and having a sort of system of thought that made you, you know, be very serious about the world and make distinctions and have complicated arguments about why the Soviet Union was or wasn't in the spirit of, Mar of Lenin and was Lenin itself in the spirit of Marx and all of that. I think one thing he learned from all of that was the limits of all these systems and ideologies yeah. and became pretty skeptical about. Now, who were some of the other students who then went on to have great careers with him? Well, Daniel Bell was there, a great sociologist who's uh, co-edited the public interest with my father for several years and is uh, alive and well, at uh, emeritus professor at Harvard. Um, one of his closest friends was a man named Martin Diamond who died uh, much younger in, in the late 70s but really was one of the key people in revitalizing the study of the Founding Fathers. Uh, he, would be, he would be happy to be alive today and see the Constitution cited everywhere, really. I mean, it's, it was such a lone enterprise when he, when he did it. Uh, my father has a piece in this book, I, and I was looking through it uh, uh, in 1987, celebrating the Constitution, and I thought, well, that was also 20 years, 23 years ahead of its, ahead of its time. But there were many famous uh, People who went on to be pretty famous intellectuals. People who went on to be famous was in Nat other ways. Was Nat Glazer there? Was he a student? Nat Glazer, I believe, was yes, was a student yeah. at CCNY at the yeah. same time. Another famous sociologist, and um, I think it was a very good education, as you say. But I think I think this is true today in college too. Most of the education came from, much of the education came from fellow students, not from the courses and not from the faculty. But um, but he went through that, and uh, meanwhile met my mother, who was a student at Brooklyn College. But they were both Trotskyites, so they met at some Trotskyite meeting. And that was one good effect of Trotskyism, <laughs> that it brought my parents together. I have a personal stake in, it, in, in thinking this is a good thing, you know. Yeah, but it was a very happy marriage. And, and Didn't end as well for Trotsky, <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Right, right. He got killed, murdered yeah. by the Stalinists, yeah. but my parents got happily married. Yeah. So. <laughs> I, one of the stories I, I tell, I read this somewhere, that at one point the Stalin, the smart kids were all the Trotskyites, I think. 
And Mostly, at one think. point, the Stalinites decided they were losing too many battles. So they said, we will no longer talk to the Trotskyites. And such was ni discipline, party discipline, even among college kids, that they actually didn't do it. And they all lived in the same neighborhoods. Uh, but that was, I don't know, I think college students today look at that period and think, wow, they really were serious about ideas. Right. But I thought, that, I assume because they thought, well, the whole world will be Marxist someday. And so right. the distinctions that we make now will actually have big effects later on. Well, and I think the degree to which the Depression, I mean, we, and then the 30s in general, the combination of the Depression and the rise of fascism and Stalinism in the Soviet Union and then Mussolini and then Hitler and then 1936 and 1938 with Czechoslovakia. I mean, the degree to which I think if you were in college in 1939, and my parents have said this to me, I mean, they just thought the world was falling, well, had fallen apart right. and either was going to just continue falling apart and then, of course, this horrible world war uh, and, and that it would just kind of go back into barbarism or chaos. Or maybe there was some system that could get us out of this. But the degree to which I think everyone thought that all the views people had had in 1928, the more conventional views, you know, liberal or conservative, uh, my, you know, strong capitalist or mild capitalist, that those were all discredited. I think people really felt that maybe more than we appreciate if you were a smart kid going to college in 1935 or 36 or 37. Right. So he's in this hothouse atmosphere, and then he goes to the Army. Right, he moves to Chicago, where my mother was in grad school, and uh, gets drafted into the army, and uh, goes over to Europe a little behind D-Day. So he kind of, I think he, he, his, his group, 12th Armored, uh, lands in Europe in, uh, later, in, or his part of the 12th Armored lands in Europe but late in 1944. And he's in the army for a couple of years, and uh, most of it is, the war ends, and most of it is a peacetime occupying Germany, and then in Marseille, where he got to work on his French and read a lot of literature. He didn't have too high, like he, I don't I have the impression he had a certain amount of spare time and he was able to read, you know, uh, Camus and Sartre so, and all these people in French. Somewhere he, he said he, he believed in socialism, then he got to the army and right. saw the people he was with and decided it would be a racket. Yeah, that's in his autobiographical <laughs> yes. memoir, which is yeah. in this book, and, and, and uh, which he wrote in, I guess, in 1995. Yeah, he, he, I think he had a certain, it's like, it's easy to romanticize the working class and romanticize what would happen if only all these authoritarian structures disappeared until you actually get with a bunch of 19 and 20 year old kids and you see there's a utility to having hierarchy and there's a utility to having rules and limits on what people can do. Um, and uh, he didn't talk much about the war, though I think he was really, that, I think that struck in the degree to which, you know, if you have a military force, uh, that absent strong rules, there'd be a lot of bad behavior, including bad behavior to German civilians, for example. When he was in Germany, he was a Jewish kid from New York, but nonetheless, I think he felt some sympathy for these civilians who, you know, whose country had totally crumbled around them and, and maybe they hadn't had much to do with it. And uh, there they were, and sort of at the mercy of Russian troops if they were in the wrong part of Germany or right. uh, much, if they were much luckier, they were at the mercy of British or, or American troops. But, um, yeah, I think it, it, it removed what was already disappearing, if you read his very early essays in this book, uh, an excessive romanticism about uh, the working class and about the public, and a little skepticism, I would even say, about um, direct democracy. Now, it's, it hadn't occurred to me until now, but he, he was very interested in religion early in his career. And you've, one of the fascinating things in this book are the very early essays. We're all familiar with the Irving Gristle wrote in the Wall Street Journal and Public right. Interest, but he wrote a lot of essays very early on, and remarkably, remarkable essays for such a young man. But it, he mentions in here that in, in early in his career, he was one of the few people in his circle really interested in religion. And there's one essay in here from, I think, 1947 on Judaism. Right. And so did he, do, you, do you know if he had contact with the Holocaust or whether uh, sort of there were, I mean, he was in Germany, a Jew in Germany in, in the right. post war. No, I mean, one of the interesting thing, well, just back up for one second about the book and without getting into the details, I mean, these, with the exception of the autobiographical essay from 1995, these are all essays that have, were not collected, he didn't collect during his lifetime. Um, so there are previously uncollected essays, so it doesn't overlap with, you know, the three or four books that were published in his lifetime. And what's, I think one of the interesting things about this book is the early essays. Uh, the first one, I think, on Auden was written when he was 22 years old. Really? Was published in a little magazine that he co-founded, a little kind of radical magazine based on partisan review. Um, and then there are these interesting essays on uh, uh, Lionel Trilling, and then in 1947, I think his first essay in commentary yeah. on sort of Judaism after the, uh, reflecting on the Holocaust in, in that essay. And he grew up um, religiously knowledgeable, I would say, but not in an observant home. Uh, he once told me that he, um, he didn't talk about this much, but after his mother died when he was, I don't know, maybe 15 or something like that, he w did go to synagogue every, I think every day, certainly every week, but I think maybe every day to say Kaddish for his mother. But after that, he, he went for 11 months and then he 
and wasn't yeah. particularly observant after that. And uh, um, I think he wasn't so sure that there was such a just God if his <laughs> right. mother had died of right. cancer at age 40 or something like that. Um, 